the thank yous to everybody first. Uh, and then there's a little bit about the um, holography research that we do in DIT. So um, holography, people are, are generally familiar with holograms from the, holo the 3D images they see on their credit card or the pictures, the 3D pictures that you can buy to hang on your wall. Um, and you know, we're also plagued a little bit by the popular knowledge of it from Princess Leia being uh, shown by R2D2 many years ago. We can't do that yet and we'll be, we're a while off from being able to do it. However, holograms do have a lot of uses that go beyond just um, visual 3D images. And I'll explain a little bit about what we do in that area today. So a little bit of a background to um, holography. And I, just to talk a bit about the setup that we use um, in, in the laboratory to make holograms uh, and the specific research that we do at DIT. So this is our, um, well, a slightly out of date uh, picture of our research group. Um, and my acknowledgements to the people there, because a lot of what I'll speak about now is, um, is done by them. Uh, uh, there's myself and um, three other staff members in the School of Physics. Uh, and there's uh, a variety of uh, postdocs who would be funded by Enterprise Ireland, for example, and postgraduates who'd be doing their PhDs or their MSCs with us. So we are around a while, um, as Siobhan was saying. We evolved out of a holography and optics group, uh, which was started in 1991. Um, and we became an official DIT research centre in 1998. Um, we filed our first patents in 2005 in the area of photopolymers for holography, so the materials that you can use to record holograms. Uh, and then we recently joined with another group in the School of Physics, the Medical Ultrasound Group. Um, we formed our first spin-out company in 2013, and they're now going strong. Um, and employing 10 people. And this is just a list of some of the people who've graduated or who've worked with us in the past. So now down to business. So um, in the area of making holograms, really from a physics point of view, um, you're talking about interference and diffraction and a bit of photochemistry. Now I'll focus mostly on the interference and diffraction end of things today, but some of what we've done is to develop new materials that, that use photochemistry to record the holograms. I'll speak about that briefly in a minute. So a hologram can really be thought of as a complex diffraction grating. We're all familiar with the uh, young slits. So this is really the basis of everything behind understanding how holograms work. Um, in the young split slits experiment, you have uh, a light wave coming along to, to um, two slits. And the, uh, those slits diffract the light so that when it reaches the screen, you get an interference pattern. Um, and most people are familiar with this. So we, we come out with the grating equation there. And that's basically just because the beam coming from one slit lags behind the beam coming from the other slit by a certain amount. And if you let, uh, you can work out with simple geometry what that amount will be. Uh, because we, you know, we, we're, we're picking at a particular angle here and we know the distance between the two slits. So there's a lag there where this beam it would be behind this beam. And if you just let that equal to an even number of wavelengths, that's where you're going to see constructive interference. Now, if it was a wavelength in between them, you'd get the destructive interference. But what we're interested in is where the beams are going to appear. So we're looking for where the constructive interference will happen. Um, and that's the grating equation. So it's, 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 it, the, the, the background to it is very simple. It's just Young's slits, But uh, you can think of a grating as just a series of slits. And the, the periodicity of the grating, the period D, would be equivalent to the distance between the two slits there. And then a hologram is just a more complex kind of grating. So another way to create an interference pattern, of course, is to interfere two coherent beams with an angle between them. And of course, it works out very similarly. These, two, these are two beams coming along to this screen, let's say. Uh, there's a certain defined angle between them there, and they have a wavelength, of course. This is meant to show the, the wave front, so the distance between them there is the wavelength, lambda. And then we'll get an interference pattern on this screen. Now, what the, the, the main thing to remember here, in, in order to understand how holograms work, is to remember that the, the, the period of this pattern here will depend on this angle here by that formula. And what we then do is we put, instead of a screen, we put a piece of, say, photopolymer there. Or you could use photographic film. People used to use photographic film before they had 
uh, photopolymers, but the difficulty there was you had to then go away and develop it the same way you do normal photographs. But they'd use high resolution photographic film there for many years, and, and many people still do. Uh, what we use is photopolymers because they react immediately to the light. You don't have to take them away and develop them or do anything to them. You'll immediately see your hologram or your grating or you'll have your beams diverted as you wish as soon as the laser light falls on them. So this would be two beams coming from a laser um, and then they'll make a, a grating with a certain period here. It's important in order to be able to see a good interference pattern or in our case to record a good interference pattern that the light is monochromatic and coherent, so usually that means it has to come from the same laser source, so you will have split it earlier in the setup. Um, and also they need to be roughly equal intensity. If you're, if you're interfering a very strong beam and a very weak beam, you'll only get a, a very small pattern and you won't, with very low contrast and you won't see it very easily and you won't record it very easily in the photopolymer. Um, and so the main thing to take away here is that the pattern is recorded in a suitable material and the pitch of the pattern depends on the angle between the beams. <coughs> So, what we do then, to tie those two things together, when you have two beams that meet at a piece of photopolymer, for example, you're going to get constructive interference where the wave fronts meet and destructive interference in between, constructive interference here, and what you'll actually get is a change in the material just at those places where the constructive interference occurred. So, you're actually recording the pattern directly into the material. And then, from the diffraction, that you'll expect to happen at that grating, as I explained earlier, you'll end up with the exact conditions to get a beam diffracted at that angle. So in other words, the thing to remember about holography is if you're combining two beams and recording the pattern, you'll end up with a diffraction grating that will reproduce the other beam. So if I come in with this beam just, I'll reproduce that one. If I come in with this beam, I would reproduce the other one. So you're, you're always able to reconstruct one of the two beams that you recorded with. And that's important when you think about how the image is recorded. Because if you've deliberately bounced one of those beams off a very complex object, you'll still record a, an interference pattern here. It won't be stripes uh, or a very easily predictable pattern. It'll be a very complex pattern. But in the same way, if you then come back with one of the beams, you'll reconstruct the other beam. So that's what a hologram is actually doing. It's reconstructing the, the light waves as they would have come from the object. And that's why when you look at it, you see it as if there's an actual solid object behind it. Okay, sorry, let's move on to the next. So this is an attempt to show that, that um, slightly better from the perspective of recording a hologram. So imagine this is the object that you want to record a hologram of. You take your light from the laser and you divide it into two beams. One of the beams will go, just as it did in the other example, bouncing off a mirror and pretty much undisturbed up to this holographic plate. The other one, however, will be sent first to an object and then it'll bounce off that object onto the plate. And everywhere here you're going to get diffraction gratings. Now if you think of it, every little bit of that is going to have a different diffraction grating whose, whose um, periodicity is determined by the angle that the beams were when they arrived at the plate. So then when you take away one of the beams and you just shine this beam here and now your object is gone, what will you get? At each point on that hologram, you'll get light diffracted as if it were coming from the object. So when you look in this direction, as an observer, you see a 3D image. And when you look this way, you'll see it and you get perspective and you get the whole 3D range. So that's, hope, that's why um, holograms perform the way they do. And you can have reflection or transmission gratings. The one I just showed you there was a reflection one. So if the two beams meet from opposite sides, then when you come in with the reconstructing beam, it'll bounce back at you. And that's the kind you'd often see on, on, um, you know, for display purposes. But you can also do the transmission type where the two beams are coming from the same side and the um, fringes are oriented um, perpendicular to the surface. And then you'll get beams going through. We use those more in the, on the devices side. So if we want to make a hologram focus like, for example, we'd use transmission grating. And in, in that case, instead of an actual 3D object, you'd put a lens in so that you're interfering two beams. This time, one of them is, is collimated and one of them is focused. So when you come back again then with a, to reconstruct with a collimated beam, you get focus light. And then your hologram is essentially performing the function of a lens. So this is how we do it um, in the lab. Um, we would have typically a laser 
Um, they can be big or small. Uh, if you want to make a very big hologram, you need a big powerful laser so that you can cover a lot of area with your light. And you, but you can do demonstrations with very small lasers. Um, we've even done it sometimes with laser pointers like this. Uh, you need a spatial filter just to clean up the beam and expand it. And then you have a lens to make it nice and neat and collimated. Here we're not actually making a hologram, we're just making a grating. Very often we do that in the lab because we'll be doing things to develop the material and gratings are very predictable. You know what the output should be. So if you're going to make changes, say, in, in the components of your material, see if it, you can make it better, you're going to do something very organized like a grating rather than do uh, 3D holograms. Um, so where was I? Yeah, so this would be our photopolymer here. The two beams meet and as I said, this angle in between them will determine the spatial frequency of the, of, the, of the pattern and the pattern that you record. In other words, the distance between the fringes. Um, and the kind of equipment we need is there's pictures of it here. You've got, um, uh, you've got a vibration isolated table because, of course, we're not at the nano scale like Gordon, but they're micro scale and vibrations will make a huge difference. Can you, you know, when, as, if things move when you're taking a photograph, you get a blur. Well, if things move by even sub-micron levels while you're making a hologram, you do indeed get a blur and you'll get no hologram. Um, so, uh, yeah, then we'll need, you know, lenses and beam splitters. Um, that'll be a typical cube beam splitter there. Just, it's basically just two prisms stuck together. Um, and you do need an, uh, your, that's, that's a typo, um, photosensitive, that should say. You need a high resolution photosensitive film. So you need a film that will respond to the light and make some change. It could be a change in refractive index. It could be a change in uh, trans, uh, absorption. So you basically get you know, black and white fringes, uh, black and clear fringes. Or it could even be uh, surface modulation. So a lot of the holograms you get in your credit cards are stamped. There are actually differences in thickness. You get the phase change from the difference in, in thickness. But something about your material needs to respond to the light and change so that the phase is recorded. Now, clicking the wrong thing. We do a lot of characterization because a lot of the work we've done is to improve these materials, um, to develop materials that, are, that were self-developing in the first place based on uh, photo, photo chemistry um, and then um, to make changes in the composition to improve it in one way or another. Um, and this would be the typical experiments that we do. So uh, a Bragg curve there, this is a Bragg curve. So when we've made the hologram or the grating rather, what we do then is we rotate it, we have a helium neon laser come in at a specific point that we want to interrogate. We rotate it with a rotation stage, and then we can see how the light that's diffracted into the diffracted beam, so the first order beam. Uh, we position our photo detector here in the first order. So the light's coming through. Some of it will go straight on through, but some of it will be diffracted here. We pick it up here, and then we get this kind of a curve. Um, which is basically very predictable from Kogelnik's couple wave theory, and we can match it and we can see a lot of things about it. The peak height will tell us how efficient it is. So if most of the light is put into this beam, you'll get a peak height of like 90% of your light or something like that, and we do that routinely. Um, and then uh, the angle that it appears at will tell us something about the fringes, if they've moved, if they've shifted, and we use that, I'll tell you about it later, in sensing, because we can get the hologram to change in some way, and then we can pick up a change in the position of the, of the um, Bragg peak. And then the width is very much dependent on the thickness of the grating. So a very thick grating will give you a very, very narrow uh, Bragg curve. And a, uh, if you think about crystallography, for example, you know, you get extremely narrow um, angular selectivity there. And we can use that to estimate the thickness as well. Sometimes we want to actually match the thickness to what we think it is. Now, so moving on to what we use these things for. One of the areas that we're strong in in DIT is um, using holograms as sensors. So the idea here is you've got a hologram, say, of a coin. The, the wavelength that's, that's diffracted back towards your eyes depends on the pitch, on the, on the distance between those fringes. So if they change for some reason, the color that you see in the hologram will change. So it's a fantastic sensor in, in the sense of being an indicator that wouldn't need you know, uh, instrumentation. It can be included in packaging and things like that because it will actually change color according to the thing it's sensing. So one of the things we have, for example, is a humidity sensor. Which, will, which is shown, oops, sorry, which is shown down here. Uh, it's red at higher humidity, then as the, the pitch shrinks, as it loses water to the environment, um, it'll go green and even blue at the very low humidity. Uh, we can also do this with pressure. So this is an example of where certain shapes have been pressed onto the surface of a hologram. So it's a different formulation. This one is sensitive to humidity, this one is sensitive to pressure, and you can just about see these are quite early results. Um, and again, up here we have uh, changing under gas sensing. 
So we can use these kind of things in packaging and also as security holograms because they're a different kind of, of security device where if you breathe on it, for example, you can show it's the genuine hologram and not a copy. Um, and also we're developing an area of gas sensing as well. And Isabella leads this. Isabella Nedeneva in the School of Physics, she leads this work and these are some of the people that are working in it. Then there's the kind of measurement of metrology. So one of the other things that you can do with holography is because you've recorded the full wavefront and you're reconstructing the wavefront off the object, if you record two, one on top of the other, and you've made some change in between, then you'll actually get interference fringes in your hologram, which will tell you how much it's changed. So this, for example, is a holographic uh, interferometry. Um, it's a photograph of actually two holograms of an uh, aluminium can that was just painted white. And in one of the holograms, there's an elastic band around the center of the can, and in the other one, there isn't. So when you reconstruct it, you see the two wave fronts on top of each other, and you see these interference fringes, which are basically mapping out the surface displacement that's happened around where the elastic band is. And it's a nice demonstration of the kind of sub-micron accuracy that you can get in mapping out your surface with holographic interferometry. This would be now a slightly different method using electronic speckle pattern interferometry, but it's very closely related. Um, and we would have used this to look at the patterns from speakers that I, the, uh, some other groups would have done, for example, full maps of a guitar. Uh, and you can see the, no, the vibrational nodes as the, um, as the music is played. So, yeah, so that's kind of a, a brief overview of, of that area. So using holograms to measure things, to measure surfaces. And then finally, um, holographic optical devices. So this is something I'm quite active in. Um, we would have done some work in applications, for example, to improve solar collectors, so collection of light from, for, and, and directing on solar cells um, for lighting applications and in beam shaping. And there's, I'll, actually, I'll just give a little bit more detail on that in the next slide. So for example, solar collection. So the idea here is that you're using the hologram not to give you an image this time, but to just redirect the light. When, it's, when, when you're looking at a 3D image, the light, as I explained, has been redirected towards your eyes. So in this case, you're actually using it to redirect, for example, laser light or light from an LED source um, as it passes through the hologram. This is the transmission type of hologram. So as you can see there, um, we're using a solar simulator and the light, the, this is your solar cell here and it's quite small. It would normally just have this amount of light landing on it, but if you put some diffractive optical elements, as we call them. They're basically just holograms of lenses, really. But they're flat and they're thin and they're only 100 microns thick. Uh, it will redirect them onto the solar cell, and then you get an awful lot more energy on the solar cell than you would have otherwise. Um, and here's just a little bit of um, data that Hoda, who was working on this, Hoda Akbari, uh, she did her PhD on this. Uh, she would have got, so here we have the size of the element um, in millimeters, and the, uh, we're getting up to a 60% increase in the, um, the light that's falling on the solar cell. That shouldn't say efficiency, actually. That should, that's the increase in the light that fell on the solar cell. Um, yeah, so that kind of covers that. Um, oh, yeah, and then so um, at the moment, we have a PhD student, um, Sanjay Keshri, and he is looking at the microstructure of the diffractive optical element, because we realized if we really want to control what these things do, we're going to have to understand better and be able to model what's happening on a micron scale. Um, and we, here's, a, here's a typical example of how one of these lenses would be recorded. So you've put a lens into one of your beams. This is just like the earlier um, diagram, but here's one uh, collimated beam, and here's one beam that you've put a lens into, so that now it focuses to this spot here before it gets to the hologram. And you can imagine here, on a, if, if you looked to that particular detail there, the angle between those two beams is there, but it's a different angle over here and a very different angle again over here. So we end up with a different spatial frequency, a different pitch in the, in the grating there compared to there compared to there. And here we've looked at the diffraction behavior. And do you remember I said the width of the curve very much depends on um, thickness, but also spatial frequency? It changes from there to there to there. Uh, and then he's also, I'm actually missing one, sorry about that. He's also got some, I don't know if you can see them very well, um, microscope images. And when he measured the, the pitch, it was exactly as, as you would expect. So we know we fully understand 
how to design this and model it, and then we match that with the diffraction behaviour and we model it and we get very good agreement. His next job now is going to be to work on getting those to be more equal, because obviously if you want to use this as a device, um, you have to have pretty good similar uh, uh, efficiency across the device, um, and we know that our material responds le less at very low spatial frequencies, so he's working on uh, bringing that up, and he's already made some progress actually since this. So then, um, finally, this is just a, a quirky little thing that the Mater the particular material that we've developed also does. When you're at very low spatial frequencies, in other words, your, your, uh, your D, your, your pitch and your grating is, is quite large, like um, a few microns, you get a funny little self-diffraction effect uh, where if you record a very weak grating to begin with and then just illuminate with one of the beams, it will, uh, it will uh, create that second beam that I talked about, but then those two beams start to interfere with each other. So you actually get growth of a grating, a new grating in the photopolymer, even when you're just illuminating with a single beam. And what's exciting about that is it's very, very resistant to vibrations. Do you remember I said earlier on that if you get any vibration at all, it can wipe out your pattern? But if you do it this way, you just have a single beam. If there is any vibration, both because the second beam is created by the first beam, they both move together and you still get a static pattern. So we've shown that this can, is a way of making holograms in any kind of environment. So hopefully this is a way to bring holography out into a, you know, a broader environment to be able to work in difficult conditions. Um, but as you can see, it's very spatial frequency dependent. So this is just a graph showing how it will work, but it won't work for the very high pitch hologram, uh, uh, very high spatial frequency holograms. So that's just an overview really of the different things that we're working on. Um, if you're interested, you can get our publications on ResearchGate. Um, do you just look up any of those names there? Uh, Isabella, myself, Jacinta, Vincent. Um, and two little news items recently um, was one of our ex-students, Viswanath, uh, was, was one of the authors. I know there were many, many authors on the recent Gravity Waves uh, publications, but still we're very proud of him. Uh, and also Mo uh, Monica, who's one of our postdocs working on the sensing side, recently did a TED Talk, so you could have a look at that if you're interested to hear more. And that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you.